What's up, Generation Church? How we doing today? So good to see you guys. My name is Ben Pierce, lead pastor here. I want to welcome you. If you are new to Generation Church, so glad that you found this home. What an amazing group of people, an amazing family to our uh, church family online watching from around the world. Uh, we miss you guys. We love you. And uh, just want to welcome everybody. Can we just give it up for our church family online and everybody that's new? Hey, real quick, I just, if you serve in any fashion at Generation Church on the Dream Team, would you take just a second and just stand up really quick? Can we just encourage all the people who serve week in and week out? Thank you guys for, for taking the mission of Jesus to this town. You can be seated. 131 people have made decisions for Jesus since January 1st this year. 131 people. And um, it, it's amazing just to see, it's incredible to see what God is doing in our church family right now and in this community. And um, one of the teams that I, I'm leading personally is our new believers team. And, and that team of people, they connect with all those hands that are going up every single weekend. If you're on the new believers team, will you just wave? Just wave, yeah, new believers team out there. Hey, look at me real quickly. If you're, if you're not making a difference for God somewhere within this church, that is a great team for you to get on. Just to go and connect with those folks that are raising their hand, give them a, a gift, uh, take them out to coffee, and, and help them connect with God and take some next steps. The team will tell you this, that the biggest problem with the New Believers team is there are too many people getting saved. Come on. Too many people for them to connect with, seriously. And so, man, alive, that's a great place for you to, uh, to make a difference. So I encourage you, uh, let us know. Go to Growth Track. Let them know you'd like to be a part of that team and make a difference in people's lives. Okay, so um, we're in a series called Hurt But Healing. How many of you guys were here last week? Great. How many of you guys are new? You're afraid to lift your hand. I saw a few of you. If you missed it last week, go back. You can watch it online. But... But um, I, I, I want to just, if you can, let's just get quiet in the room for a moment. I, I just want to help you connect with maybe some things that um, have hurt you in the past. Last week, we kicked the series off and we talked about those past hurts. I told the story of the first funeral that I ever had to officiate, which was that of my 33-year-old cousin. And there's a lot of pain in life. And as we get into today's message... I want to talk to you about the people that have hurt you. Now, you've made your own mistakes and you have your own moments in your own past. Those hurts are, are in some ways, part of your decision-making process. But then there are people in your life that just seem to come out of nowhere. And, and maybe you've had deep, connected relationships with them. And, and somewhere in the process of life, Somehow you got hurt. It's called, called part of just being human. Like we just end up hurting each other. Sometimes we don't even know that we do it. If I had to guess, I would say 100% of the people in this room and just people in general have been hurt by somebody somewhere at some point. 100% of us. But here's what I know is in the middle of, of all of that hurt is where the walking wounded, that there's a healer that exists. There's a healer that wants to, to take those places of pain, those people that have perpetrated against you and, and created a wound. There's a healer that wants to heal you. Now, now today is is not an over-spiritualized attempt to just tell you to suck it up. That's not what this is. But while we have practical steps for getting healed of the things that have hurt us, more powerful than all the practicality is the presence of God. And I know that you've probably had somebody tell you, you just need to read your Bible more, and you just need to pray more, you just need to come to church more. You just need to do this more. And, and all the onus is put back on you. You just need God to do this or that or the other. And, and while we, we take these practical things and we, we mix them together with our faith, at the end of the day, you just need to see God face to face. 
And it is my prayer today that as I unpack this passage of Scripture for you, that, that you would see God face to face in your pain and in, in your your wounds and and the things that you've tried to conceal, the things that you've tried to to cover up, the the things that you've tried to set aside in life. And it is my prayer today that as you connect with the power and presence of Jesus himself, that you would experience healing. The deepest parts of your soul. So would you close your eyes with me today as I pray? God, we just bless you today. We thank you that God, you have a plan and a purpose for us, that God, you take the pain that people have inflicted on us and God, we learn from it, you use it. And on the other side of that pain, God, you have great purpose for us. So God, as we open our hearts today and we become vulnerable, would you speak to us? Would you show up today? I thank you for it, God, right now. In Jesus' name. You know, as we start to unpack this today, I, I want to start with this question because I think it helps you just to, to locate your heart. Have you ever been in life in a place that you were hurt so bad that you began to make drastic, drastic moves in order to get away from that pain? Like, like you've been hurt so bad that you cut friends loose. Or you've been hurt so bad that you won't call mom and dad anymore. You've been hurt so bad that you would quit a job. Or you've been hurt so bad that you would actually pack up your family and move to another part of town. Or maybe even move to another state or move to another city. That you've been hurt so bad in your life that you didn't know what to do. The only thing you could do was pack up what you could get and just get the heck out of Dodge. You just had to run. Anybody? Anybody ever been in that place? A lot of us have been in that place in life where where we have been hurt so bad. And and you kind of wonder, like, how in the world can people treat other people the way they do? And it's interesting because when we get hurt, we we do kind of take on a little bit of a victim mentality that, that, that looks at just how we are affected in that. But there's more to the story than just how people have hurt you and how it has uh, affected you. We're going to look like that. But, but here's the thing. Anytime somebody hurts you, it feels like straight up betrayal. I mean, anytime somebody does something to you that that you take personally and it wounds you, I mean, they might as well be Jesus. Sold you out for 30 people. Judas sold you out for 30, not Jesus. (laughs) Jesus didn't betray you. Judas betrayed Jesus. Straight up Judas sold you out for 30 pieces of silver. And sometimes even though we may have had a part to play in that, we still feel these immense feelings of of just betrayal. And so we quit our jobs, we burn our bridges, we move to a new city, we throw in the towel on on relationships. We we, we do all of these things to distance ourselves from the pain that people have inflicted upon us. But the isolation that comes from that is not the solution to the pain. The isolation just gets you in a place where actually the pain begins to fester. But this is human nature, right? The, the human nature is like, you hurt me, I got to get away from you. And when you feel that betrayal and you feel that pain, you want to isolate and you don't because you're afraid somebody else is going to hurt you just like the other person did. So we start changing out friends. We start changing out all of our our people that we hang out with. We start just replacing them for different things. You're not the only one in life to, to ever go through this, though. Everybody goes through it. This is an interesting thing about, about pain, especially when a friend or, or someone hurts you or says something or does something that wounds you and you, you feel this betrayal. You feel like you are the only one that has ever experienced that. All of a sudden, you feel like nobody else knows you. Nobody else feels what you feel. Nobody else could even comprehend because it's this little part and, and this is part of my story and this happened. And, and all of a sudden, we do begin to build up in our mind, in our world, that my situation is unique. And it's never happened before. Nobody else has ever faced this. 
And when we begin to, to allow the situation to, to become unique in our mind, we, we begin to elevate it and we begin to, to, to nurture it and we begin to, to, to coddle that thing. And instead of being healed from it, we, we kind of codify around it and, and begin to monument it and, and, and make it or memorialize it and make it this thing in our lives that, that we kind of hold on to. And, and you know you've met folks that have been wounded so deeply because it oozes out all the time. You ever, ever talk to somebody that they're, they're dealing with a major pain. If anything should ooze out of you, it should not be pain. Like you were destined by God for something to come out of you, but it's not pain. You were destined by God for, for living water to flow out of you, not for woundedness to flow out of you, not for, for this thing that, that tends to fester and grow in the deep recesses of your soul. God wants to heal you from that. You're not the only one. We all have faced that. And I want to take a second and just prove it to you. I want you to, to lift your hand if you've ever been hurt by a person before. Just lift your hand. Now look, take a look around the room. There's not a person in here. Now even though it feels like you're the only one, everybody has faced it at some point. And because we all face it, God has provided a way for us to be healed from it. In our opening text this weekend in the book of Genesis, if you'd like to turn there, I'm going to read 13 verses, so hang with me. Try not to fall asleep. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 16, it says, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai told Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Turn to your neighbor and say, uh-oh. Mm-hmm. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarah's proposal. Turn to your other neighbor and say, uh-uh. What is he thinking? Verse 3, so Sarah, Abraham... Abraham's wife took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. Verse 4. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar. She became pregnant. But when Hagar knew that she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abram, this is all your fault. Now, I don't want to get into a message on relationships or marriage. But where is she going here, guys? I mean, Abram, this is all your fault. Welcome to life. She says, I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. I mean, come on. This had to be happening at 3 o'clock in the morning in a tent somewhere in the desert. And there's clay pots being slammed around and thrown across the tent. Tent poles are getting taken out and thrown at Abram. I mean, this has got to be one of those knockdown, down drag out 3 a.m. fights that all you married people act like you don't have. <laughs> oh. Abram replied, look, she's your servant. So deal with her as you see fit. A Abram needed a little bit of uh, some marriage help. And then Sarah treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness, along the road to a place called Shur. And the angel said to her, Hagar, Sarah's servant, where have you come from? And where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she replied. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. And then he added, and I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. And you are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry, the cry of your distress. And this son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. Donkey. In the King James, I won't tell you what it says. A wild donkey. And he will raise his fist against everyone 
and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. And she also said, I have truly seen the one who sees me. It's an interesting passage of Scripture. It's the only time in Scripture when this name of God is revealed to us, El Roi. It literally means that God is the God who sees. And in our pain, regardless of where it comes from, what people have perpetrated it against us, what part we had to play in it, God sees. God knows, he understands, he hears. And I want to take some time this weekend and and I want to unpack this passage of scripture and I want to do it verse by verse because I think there's so much in this that, that God wants to give us from a practical perspective to help us navigate personal pain. You know, personal pain causes us to do some dumb things. You know, Abram and Sarai were, were here unable to have kids. And, and I think Melissa and I know, and many of you know, the personal pain of that all too well. And in their place of pain, Abram and Sarai did some dumb things. I mean, we laughed about it just a second ago. Abram and Sarai go through this whole dissertation, and the cleaning lady comes in, and Sarai says, here's the cleaning lady. And Abram is so stupid that he connects with her, has a child with her, and thinks everything is going to be okay. I think it's an important thing as we unpack this passage of Scripture because it's important to know that that when people hurt us, it doesn't just come from a place of their own malfeasance. It's not just nefarious behavior that's just being perpetrated on us. So often when, when people hurt us, it comes from a place of their own personal pain. Abram and Sarah were, were in excruciating pain, they, and they did extremely dumb things. Sarah, can you imagine the pain that she was navigating? Get this for a second. God has told them that they would be the, the parents of many nations, that as the sand of the sea exists and the stars in the sky, they would be descendants. And well into their 80s, 90s, and even at 100 years old, they still didn't even have one child that they could call their own. Have you ever been in that place? Years of silence while God's working on you. You're waiting on the promise. And every time you go to God when nothing happens, you hear radio silence. Can you imagine what what that isolation must have felt like, the pain that that existed in Abram and Sarah's heart and, and in their life? I can, I can understand, begin to understand how Sarah would say what she said and, and put together what she put together. She was just trying to, to work on her own pain. Such an important perspective to have as you navigate life. Because it feels like when people hurt you, that they just did it to do it. But there's always so much to the rest of the story. There's always so much to the other side of the coin. The, the scripture actually tells us in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 17 that, that the first to speak in the court always sounds right until the cross-examination happens. And we kind of set ourselves up like this in life. Like, it's just this happened to me. They did this. But if we take time, I think this is part of the healing process, if we take time to try to seek and understand maybe the other side of the coin, the the, the place in which another person was coming from when they perpetrated against us, I think it helps us understand why this could have happened. And it takes a little bit of the sting out. This is an important part of the healing process. To understand that, that hurt people hurt people. I'll never forget this. I was riding the school bus as a young boy. I may have been in third grade. And uh, we had this crazy, crazy, long-haired kind of school bus driver. And he always wore like a a ball cap and his hair just stuck out from under the ball cap. Crazy. 
His name was Marvin. He drove a hundred miles an hour with third graders all over East Tennessee and he would chew tobacco and he would drive with the door open and he would literally spit from the driver's seat down the stairs out the door of a moving bus. Marvin was crazy. He should have been arrested and put in jail. So we're driving along, and, and Marvin is, is, is making his way through, and he, he would end up in the ditch sometimes. I mean, this school, it was, it was ridiculous. Like, it's, if he saw speed bumps, you could see him. He'd look up in the mirror. And when there were speed bumps, he would floor it. He drove that school bus like a race car. And one day it caught up with him as he's coming around a corner. Somebody's pet dog runs across the street and he nips the dog with the school bus. And the dog is, is laying there and this little third grader gets off the bus and, and runs down to grab his dog and the dog is, is whimpering. And as soon as this little boy goes down to, to grab his dog and pick his dog up and help him and comfort him, guess what the dog did? He bit the stew out of the little boy. I mean, he laid into him like nothing else. And I remember watching this take place as a third grader thinking to myself, that's what happens when you try to help hurt people. That reaction is, is not just something that you find in the animal kingdom. The same thing happens. If, if you, I did my EMTB when I was in college a long time ago, and, and uh, if you're out trying to rescue someone who's drowning, the first thing they will do is drown your butt to save their own. And it's not that they hate you. It's not that they're trying to kill you. They're just trying to survive. It is just part of human nature and hurt people, hurt people. And I think when this perspective is important for us to know. See, we, we get into this place and, and, and just think that it just happened. People just did this to you. But they're really navigating their own pain. The other thing that I think is important to, to understand about this is you also have your part to play in this. Now, now, this next section is, is going to be a little bit hard to hear. But so often the truth is hard to hear. Because none of us, save Jesus, are perfect in this life. And when you read the story, you find that Sarah, in her own place of personal pain, is trying to navigate this. And caught up in the wake of her own personal pain is Hagar. But then Hagar has this, this moment where she becomes Abram's wife. She has a child. And then the scripture tells us that she began to treat Sarai with contempt. Now, we're not always innocent in the, the interactions that, that cause us personal pain. But we tell ourselves we are. We tell ourselves that, no, they just did that. But at the end of the day, there is always a little bit of each person that weighs into this. And I think part of the healing process requires us to begin to be honest with ourselves and look at this and say, you know what? That person went way out of range. They, they did something that they should have never done, but, but your own personal healing requires you to, to be honest and humble and say, you know what? but I also had a part to play in that. And so Hagar begins to treat Sarai with contempt and, and it actually begins to, to backfire on her. And in verse uh, five, you know, we see Sarah said to Abraham, this is your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. And the Lord's gonna show who's wrong, you or me. What a mess. Verse 6, Abraham replied, look, she's your servant, so just deal with her as you see fit. And then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she ran away. And this is the point where the pain begins to be inflicted on Hagar. To the place where the wound happens and it is unrepairable. This is not just a, a place of, of um, aggravation. It's not just a place of, of intensity in a relationship. This is a place where the gloves have come off and, and the pain that Sarai was experiencing and the pain that Hagar was experiencing come together and it is a, an all out brawl. And Hagar gets the short end of the stick. And she gets to this place where she can no longer stay. She finally ran 
away. And this is what happens in life. We start to distance ourselves from the people that have hurt us. We start to isolate ourselves. We, we start to, to create some space, some buffer zone between those places of pain. And, and what happens when we begin to create that place of, of buffer and that place of isolation and that distance between the person, all we're doing is, is beginning to, to come back and cultivate that hurt. In isolation, nothing really gets better. It's in that place of isolation where the people that you actually needed in your life to help you navigate the wrong are no longer there. But it's, it's how we operate. It's human nature. It's how we feel when, when things begin to happen. It's our, our default baseline. In some ways, no matter how far we've come or how much we've grown, when we get hurt, we tend to spiral down to where we started from and we go back. And, and I think this is interesting because if you unpack part of the passage, you find that, that Hagar, she runs away and she begins to make her journey back to where she came from. She's an Egyptian slave. And she's on her way back to, to Egypt and she's trying to find some place of, of solstice for her, her, her life and her soul, some, some type of salve to apply to this wound. She's pregnant. She's alone. She's in the wilderness on her own. And the only people that had cared for her have now hurt her. And she is isolated. In verse 7, the angel of the Lord shows up and found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness on the road to Shur. Now, this, this word Shur is an interesting place because Shur is, is in the middle of the passage, the trade routes between Egypt and the rest of the Middle East. As a matter of fact, this place Shur is, is one of those places where you look at it on the map and you think to yourself, why would anybody build a settlement there? She finds her place in in a place called Shur. Shur in the Hebrew literally means a place of fortification. It means a place that has been walled up. It literally means that, that in her process, as she's going back to her baseline, she's isolating from the people that have cared for her, and she's, she's, she's coddling and cultivating this hurt. She's going back to where she started, and she begins to fortify her heart around the pain. Isn't that how life is? We begin to make the case. Can't believe they did that. And then we begin to tell other people, can you believe that they did that? And then all of a sudden we begin to, to, to make our case around this place of pain and we begin to bring other people into it because we're trying to find somebody to corroborate it with us. And we're trying to help somebody else get into this place with us to, to help us feel better about what happened instead of just allowing God to begin to heal it. When I was in college, I, I um, spent some time with, with some friends, and um, I uh, actually dated one of my friend's nieces. And at this stage in my life, I, I was kind of past like all of the party scene. I was already serving God. I was already working on staff at a church. And I was kind of in a place where the next person that I dated was, was someone that I really thought could be the one that I would marry. That's just where my frame of mind was. And as I dated this person and my friends were involved, the, the, the uncle of this girl, he became involved in the situation. And I knew that something was not quite right. I knew that there was some kind of something happened that there, you can tell when people are talking. And so as, as this thing kind of progressed and it got out of control, I isolated myself. I ran. I broke it off. And I didn't really find out later until I was hanging out with some other friends where one of my friends who was a girl said, yeah, you know, he approached me and, and said, you know, that Ben guy, you should go out with him. And she said, well, I thought he was dating so-and-so. And my friend said, well, I'm taking care of that. And I remember hearing those words. And they cut me to the core. And I began to, to create my own little world around that. 
I began to, to build in my, my own mind how wrong this thing was. I began to build my own case. I began to go back to my baseline. I left, I moved away, I moved to another state. The first night that I, I, I moved into my new place, I'd been working on staff at a church. I hadn't touched alcohol or anything in years. The first night that I moved in, I got drunk. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, wallowing in my own pain, thinking to myself, well, all that progress, gone. Drink after drink after drink. And I felt myself in that moment spiritually beginning to slip away. And I can tell you that for about three months there, I really struggled with my next steps. I'd been on staff at a church. I hadn't touched alcohol in a long time, but in the place of my pain, I reverted back to my baseline. This is exactly what, what Hagar was doing and it's exactly what many of us do. We, we revert back to this baseline. We go back to this place called Shur, which is in the middle of nowhere. It's isolated. It's in a wilderness. And just as the word says in Hebrew, it is a place of fortification around our heart. It literally means walled up. And this is such a vital part to understanding how to be healed from the people that have hurt you. Because you wall it up. But you got to let those walls be broken down. Second Chronicles 16 and 9 says this, that the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. I love this passage of scripture because for the first time in the middle of Hagar's pain, God shows up and he uses her name. He says, Hagar. He didn't call her servant girl. He didn't say, hey, Egyptian. He didn't say anything derogatory. He used her name and he calls her out and he says to her, Hagar, Sarah's servant, where have you come from and where? Are you going? And for those places of pain in your life today, I believe the Holy Spirit is asking you the same question. Where have you come from? And where are you going? Where have you been? And how has your direction changed? Are you heading backwards? Are you heading back to the familiar? Are you heading back to the baseline? Are you heading back to those other places? Are, are you walking away from all that God has done in your life over this past season? Where are you heading? He says this, verse 9, the angel of the Lord, who is God himself, he says to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. You have got to be kidding me. Like, this is God's plan? Return and submit? I don't think so. She heard me. She did me wrong. I got to return. I've got to submit. You have had to have lost your mind. Not going to do that. Can you imagine this, this conversation that she must be, be having? But here's what God knows about your situation. That if you don't confront the pain that exists in the present, the pain that will happen in the future will far exceed anything. If you don't confront the pain that has happened in your present, the pain that you will experience in your future will be far, far worse. The best example that I can give you is, is, is this, the, the, this uh, dichotomy of a cavity versus an abscess. How many of y'all want to go to the dentist today? Anybody? Nobody wants to go get a cavity filled, but what happens if you don't confront the pain of having a cavity filled? You got to have the tooth pulled. And this is the, the part of the process of life that, that God's trying to get her to. And, and for you as well, we want to isolate. We want to get ourselves in the wilderness. But when you confront the pain, it starts the healing process. He then added this in verse 10. He said, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said that you're now pregnant and you're going to give birth to the son. You're going to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. Did you know that there is purpose beyond the pain that you feel right now? 
Like, you, you got to step back for a second and just understand that, that in all of the pain that you feel, all of the things that have hurt you, that God has a greater purpose. And she was trying to isolate. She was trying to move on. But God was actually trying to birth a nation out of her. God was actually trying to, to, to do something in her that was significant. He was going to take a nameless slave girl from Egypt and make her the matriarch of 12 princes. And I wonder what purpose exists for you beyond the place of your pain right now. What is it that you've got to confront right now that is the, the wall between you and what God wants to take you to? There's great purpose on the other side of your pain. And then verse 13 happens. This is where the healing begins to take place. Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. And she also said, I have truly seen the one who sees me, El Roy. This is the thing about God. In whatever pain you have, he knows. Whatever situation happened, he knows. He knows that that person was probably dealing with their own pain and you were perpetrated against in that. He knows, he sees. And this is the thing that the enemy wants to do is he wants you to feel like nobody sees and nobody knows and nobody cares so that you'll back away from God's purpose. And God reveals himself this one time to us, to mankind as the God who sees. And this, this phrase, the God who sees, is not just a visual thing. It's the God who feels you, who gets you, who understands you, who feels the pain, who knows what you're going through. It's not just a visual thing. God knows exactly every aspect of what you've been through. And she says back to him, this is the God who sees me, and I have truly seen El Oroi, the God who sees. If you want to be healed from those things that have hurt you in the past, you have to have a face-to-face -face moment with God. I'm not saying he's going to tell you to go back and confront that person. I'm not telling you he's going to tell you to go back and submit to that person. I'm not telling you that her story is your story or my story is your story. I'm telling you that from the place of interacting with the God who sees you, who gets you, who understands, who feels it, from that place, he will give you steps. That's how we get healed. The one thing that you can do is you've got to begin to open your heart to the God that sees you.